Look at my panicked face. Look at my panicked, codependent, people-pleasing face. Might have sorted out the emotional flashbacks. I haven't sorted out the people-pleasing ness, though. This might be a tricky video for some people. I'll try and make it as non-tricky as I can. Um, this isn't fully formed, this idea. It's, it's, it's just an idea that's occurred to me in the last, well, probably about five hours ago now. Obviously, the Silence the Inner Critic course is out now, and it's on my mind, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm going, you know, what are we really re reducing this down to? How would I teach a 12-year-old what it is? And when you're teaching kids, 12, 13, 14-year-olds, you try and make things colourful, you try and reduce it down to like an image or a cartoony sort of version of what's going on, just so it sticks and so they can access it quickly. And I was like, well, I guess it's kind of like the devil on the shoulder. And I was like, yeah, it's the devil on the shoulder, it's the devil on the shoulder, it's the devil on the shoulder. It's not the angel on the shoulder, it's the devil on the shoulder. It's a little voice that's telling you that you're bad, you're wrong, something is up with you. And I was like, yeah, I like that. I went to the gym, a place I go to dissociate pleasantly for a few hours, have a bit of cathexis, I think it's called, um, a cathartic cathexis for a Catholic. And I, in the cathedral, it, so I went and I uh, was lifting weights. Um, and you know how sometimes you get like a lyric stuck in your head. And I always, I, I always say to people, like, if you get a lyric stuck in your head, you try and think what the lyric is and, like, if it has any meaning, because maybe the unconscious is trying to talk to you. Well, I didn't have a lyric stuck in my head. I, I had a sentence, like a lyrical sentence. Um, and it was just, uh, it was just narcissism is a defense mechanism. Defense mechanism. Defense mechanism. Narcissism is a defense mechanism. I'm doing weights, doing a little shoulder routine, doing a bit of running. Narcissism is a defense mechanism. Is and then I went, hang on. It's like when somebody's doing work in the background, like road work, or there's a, there's a noise buzzing in the background and you don't notice, you just go along with it at first, and then your brain goes, hang on, that's enough now. <laughs> I've heard that engine. I've heard that alarm go off. That's enough. So I was like, that, that, that is enough. What, what, what is this? Narcissism is a defense mechanism inside my own head. Chatting away to myself inside my own head as I'm doing, as I'm training. Narcissism is a defense mechanism. What are you thinking about that for? I went, okay, well, is it? Yes, okay. We know narcissistic personality disorder is a defense mechanism. What's it a defense mechanism to? It's a, it's kind of a coping mechanism. It's kind of a coping strategy and a defense mechanism against a hostile environment in childhood. That's how narcissistic personality disorder is formed. It's formed in a hostile environment in which... You know, to paraphrase Sam Vaknin, the child is put on the pedestal and also the pedestal is put on the child, where the child is simultaneously dehumanized and degraded as nothing and uh, uplifted and um, upheld as godlike. Nothing and 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 godlike. Nothing. I didn't think you were bored of it yet. Um, so nothing and godlike or goddess-like at the same time. So I'm a worthless piece of shit beyond shit, just useless nothingness. And godlike, mystical, all-powerful, uh, majestic, uh, terrifying, awe-inspiring, all-powerful, all-potent, omnipotent. And I'm nothing. And these two polarities, I think, uh, this is the way I think it plays out in the narcissistic personality and its derivations, borderline and, and so on, is I'm wonderful. I'm the most, what not I'm wonderful. That would probably would be moderately healthy narcissism. I'm wonderful. Yeah, okay, you're vain. You're a bit of a tit, but whatever. I'm wonderful is not dangerous. I am the most wonderful creature in the world and all shall bow down before me. Do you remember the Lord of the Rings where... The lady who ran the forest, that was like her hood. Uh, she was called Forest Lady, and it was called the Forest Woody Wooded Hood. She was the queen of the elves, and she had this moment where she went into a weird flashback, and uh, she was like, I, I would, I, she saw the ring, she saw Frodo with the ring, and she was like, I would like the ring, and if I held the ring, and her voice goes all weird, and she kind of goes into this altered state, and the picture of her face changes, and she was like, and everybody would kneel before me. And she was like, I'd be the most beautiful. I'd be the most wonderful. I'd be the most powerful, the strongest queen who had ever lived and all would kneel before me. And then suddenly she's looking for dominance. She becomes a totalitarian. She becomes a tyrant in the possible possession of this power. I think that's a meme on the internet amongst the kids now. 
know, I'd look at stuff on Instagram and some of it I'm like, that's funny. And then other of it I'm going, I'm old. I'm old as fuck. I don't understand any of these jokes anymore. Um, shut up. See that noise in the background that then comes into your head? So what is it a defense mechanism against? It's a defense mechanism against a hostile environment in which the child is dehumanized. And it doesn't know that. It doesn't say that. It, 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 you know, a child under the age of five is not sat there going, ah, mother is upholding me as a godlike creature because father is abusing me. And you, da, 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 da. you can't, like, there's no way that that little child can, can, can conceptualize that. But they know that something is wrong. They know they're not being loved in the way that they want to be loved. They know that they are being um, objectified, but they don't know the word objectification. They don't know the cause of it. They just know that mommy and daddy feel a certain way about me and that I'm only receiving a certain kind of love, not true love, not unconditional, warm, open human love, but adoration, sort of a hyper tense, hysterical adoration. Be wonderful. Be the best piano player, the best physics student, the best whatever it is, the most beautiful now so that I, as the tyrannical parent, can bask in the sort of the, you know, Munchausen syndrome by proxy, narcissistic supply by proxy. How do I feed off your wonderfulness as my child? Like a thing, like a, a precious possession that I would use to show off with. In, the, in that state of um, excess, it's like an excess of the ego where the ego expands this is just my dumb theory the ego expands so it's so big it kind of becomes ego less because it's just it, it goes out of the person into the world and you and i and the objects and and the, all of the people and all of the things that are perceived it's a little bit philosophical i suppose kind of this expanding sphere where the ego should be here and my ego boundary should be well this is me the ego just blows up and starts to suck in and encompass. There's a film where this happened. Annihilation. There's a film where the, the alien space that perverts uh, DNA and excessively creates mega alligators with sharks for eyes. And, you know, if you've seen Annihilation, it, it's worth a go. It's, just, it's an odd film. And, and this, this space is expanding and it just sucks everything into it. That's the narcissistic ego that gets so big, it kind of becomes ego less. Because you're in it, I'm in it. We're all living inside of their universe now and we're all part of them. So you walk up to somebody with NPD, your narcissistic ex-partner or current partner, and the way they speak to you, the entitlement and the odd things they do and they say, it's because you're part of them. They can't see you. You're in their fractured view of reality, you're part of them. But what's important as far as the devil on the shoulder goes, which is the inner critic, which is the inflamed superego, is that narcissistic personality disorder, yes, it's a defense mechanism against a hostile environment, but that hostile environment of childhood becomes internalized. And that internalization becomes the superego. So the superego is supposed to be controlling our, what in times gone by would have been called a moral system or a morality, um, but probably now is, is a more nuanced and more neutral and better to understand way of looking at it would be your, your value system. What values will you move towards? What values will you stay away from? That's the superego. Go over there. Don't go over there. Do this. Don't do that. That's the superego function. But if the child, the NPD child, is raised in a very, very hostile environment like that, what, the way their parents love them and the way their parents show them attention is the way they love and show attention to themselves. So if the parents love them, not really, hysterically adore them for narcissistic supply, then the way the child loves itself is by hysterically adoring itself for narcissistic supply with an undercurrent of, I don't think hysteria is too strong a word to use. I mean, you tell me, have you ever encountered an NPD or a BPD or, or, or a psychopathic and social person who's just calm and just chill? And just sat there, just da, 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 just being a person, just a human, just, but you know, what am I thinking about? I like cats. I think I prefer pistachio ice cream or no, that it's marked by hypervigilance. Um, Sam Batman talks about uh, ideas of reference where the narcissistic personality sits in a, a social environment and just assumes everyone is talking about them. Then there's paranoia, you know, because like, well, they must all be talking about me. Why? Because I'm the most important thing. What do you mean? Why? I'm, I'm me. I'm the most important thing in the world. I'm hysterically loving myself in this adoring, uh, narcissistically adoring myself in this boundaryless way. 
I'm the center of the fucking year. Of course you're all talking about me. I'm the pinnacle. I'm the center. You're all spokes. I'm the sun. You're all the fucking... They're not even planets. You're just little tiny moons around the planets. That's how you... Bleh. You just, you're here to reflect, but you have no light. None of you, I am the light and the way. I am the light and the way. You don't have light. I'm the light. Your moon pale surface reflects it back. That's it. That's all you got. You got my light. That's it. I give you life. I am the all goddess. Uh, the, the all goddess uh, elf lady of the, the wooded hood who will be the greatest, most powerful queen the world has ever seen and all shall kneel before me. I will be God, the all father, the all seeing eye, the Amen Ra. I'm everything. I'm seeing everything. I'm knowing everything. It's just pure. I am pure knowingness. I am that which knows. You're like, Jesus, dude. <laughs> There's, there's being a bit vain and then there's like mystical levels of vanity where you need to have magical beliefs to be this vain. But it is magical. It is a mystical belief system. It is a magical belief system because it's a child's belief system. It's the belief system of a four-year-old. The superego is the new hostile environment. They live in a hostile environment inside their own heads. I once had a guy who gave me terrible trouble in business for years kept on attacking me and kept on attacking me. And one day he was talking at me and he said, you know, you think it's bad for you. You don't have to be inside of my head with this voice. And he'd actually been diagnosed as a, properly diagnosed as a psychopath. And he's living with this terrible voice, which is the superego. It's the superego injunction to punish others. This is what happens in narcissistic personality disorder to uh, you know, people talk about borderlines and their obsession with punishment, talionic punishment, an eye for an eye. You affronted me, so now I should blah, blah, blah. You know, like there's vendettas, blood vendettas that need to go on for years because you, you did the thing to me. And you're like, I, I offered you a cup of tea. I j it was a cup of tea. It was nothing, I swear. So they live in this hostile environment inside their own heads, inside their own hearts with that superego. That's the inner critic. It's, of course, then you smart people will tell me, of course, but the, the superego, uh, as far as CPTSD is concerned, is not just the inner critic. It's also the outer critic. Yes, absolutely. And narcissistic personality disorder is marked by a hyperactivated outer critic. There's somebody at the door. Come in. Can you come back in 10 minutes? Yes. Thank you very much. These are the invasions of the superego. They have come. There's no escaping them. It's a simple injunction. I've been invaded by my own thoughts. So it's like inception this. Um, so they're stuck in this situation. And what did I want to say? Here's what I don't want to say. I don't want to say that the silence, the inner critic course is going to heal the superego of a narcissist and is going to heal narcissistic personality disorder. It absolutely isn't. It's not designed for that and it will not do that. It won't. And the other thing that I wanted to not say is don't then take from this, oh, there's hope. I can fix him. I can love him better. I can love her better if I could just throw more love into the sucking void of their empty heart. Everything will be OK. No. And if anything, you'll probably make them sicker because you're playing their game the way they want it to be played, which is a neurotic game that was born of trauma. Terrible trauma. Trauma that unless we lived it as a four year old. I mean, imagine the horrifying magical reality. You know, you need to watch one of those films where humans I don't know, there's probably a bunch of them uh, where humans are interacting with gods and arguing with gods and arguing with goddesses and fighting them and bargaining with them and hiding from them and fawning with them and freezing in front of them, Medusa. Um, that's, that's the level that it's at. It's that sort of childhood trauma where you can't have the boundary to understand that this isn't a mystical experience. It's a, just part of the crude material realm, but to a child, it's all magic. It's all fucking magic. We have to have the magic beaten out of us by the time we become adults. In some ways, that's what that's what adulthood is. It's having the fucking magic beaten out of you. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Click. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's hard as, a, as an adult to hold on to the magic, though. 
you know, you do need to, but that's, that's probably a, a subject for another video. So I'm not saying the science of the inner critic course is going to cure NPD, absolutely not. And I'm not saying that you should hold on to hope for curing NPD through the science of the inner critic course, absolutely not. This came from me thinking, science of the inner critic course is basically looking at the problem of the demon on the shoulder. And then me going, well, narcissism is a defense mechanism against a hostile environment in childhood. That then grown child stuck in an adult's body spends the rest of their life fighting the demon on the shoulder and you become the demon on the shoulder and I become the demon on the shoulder. And sometimes it's the inner critic that's activated when I'm in narcissistic depletion. And then I go into that polarity that says you're worthless and you're a piece of shit. And sometimes it goes into the outer critic where you're all wrong. And I go into the other polarity where I'm godlike. I am faultless. I am blameless. I am faultless. I am the perfect being. And you are wrong. You are deficient in my sight. You are loathsome unto me. Your sacrifices that you burn, that I smell with my godlike nose holes, mean nothing. And now I shall castigate you, horrifying me, terrifyingly, like a small child pulling their wings and legs off a daddy long legs. I will burn all your cattle, afflict all your wives with boils, and turn your children into pillars of sprite. That's the first thing I saw, and I'm not going to apologize for the fact that made no fucking sense. So, if we were going to look at dealing with NPD and trying to help people with NPD, or maybe just help people with narcissistic traits, or maybe help people who are borderline personality disorder, because there does seem to be more, there does seem to be more of an inroad. Maybe what it is that the people who say that uh, have been diagnosed as borderline personality disorder, maybe they're, maybe, maybe if you're not that, right, this is, I'm making this up on the fly. Could you tell? Oh, you could tell, right? Because it was so seamless and slick. I thought you would have thought that I'd wrote this out before. This is a new idea that I just made up right now. Could be nonsense. Narcissism occurs on a spectrum. I'm a clinician. Somebody comes to me and I'll go, well, male, female, if it's a male, it's narcissistic personality disorder or they're a psychopath. It's a female, or they're borderline or they're histrionic. Yes, that happens. Here's another idea. Zero to 10 on the spectrum. Zero is the lowest scale of narcissism. Full on narcissism is at 10. Well, if somebody's at zero to five and I can kind of talk to them and negotiate with them and maybe see where they've done wrong at times and they're not sure and like, you yeah, know, I did that and I shouldn't have done it. And then they feel guilty and they can go into depletion. There's more like a vulnerable narcissism there. Maybe that's lower on the spectrum. Maybe they, I, this is, I'm making this up. There's no clinical basis to this. It's just an idea. And maybe as we go higher up the spectrum, as it gets stiffer, as it gets stronger, as it gets more like, no, I am the fucking ultimate goddess of the wooded hooded. I am the godlike character who is faultless, who is blameless, and everybody else is wrong and faulted in my sight. You're all at fault. You're all less than. You're all, I created you, but I did it wrong. I was hung over on the seventh day. And look at you. Look at your face. Why is your nose like that? Why? Why? Burn him. Burn her. Get rid. Flood them. Flood them all. Flood it. Fuck it. Fuck it. Flood them all. Start again. Maybe God of the Old Testament had some resilience issues. Maybe there's just a few, you know, maybe he needed some coping strategies. <laughs> I'm going to offend so many fucking people. <laughs> <sighs> so, <clears throat> if we could help, maybe we can help at the lower end of the spectrum. And maybe one place to begin would be deal with the emotional flashbacks. But to turn that inner critic, the demon on the shoulder, from a harsh, critical voice into a more compassionate voice. With full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, none of that will work. Let me be absolutely brutally clear with you. And people have said to me over the years, hey, Richard, you're frustrating and it's contradictory. You say we should never give up hope. You say that mental health issues always have... There's always something we could create, something that we could do. It doesn't require drugs or lobotomizing people or dipping them in ice water or chopping bits of them off. All of things which have been done over the years by the psychiatric community to heal emotional wounds. Hmm. Uh, why do you give up on NPD? And it's like, I d I've never really had the time and the space to sort of fully explain, like, you've got to understand how limited therapy is. Like, you're here of your own volition. 
If somebody clockwork oranged you and strapped you into a chair and popped your eyes open and put the little saline droppers into your eyes and forced you to watch this, if you had NPD, you could just be thinking about something else. You could just totally dissociate or inside your head, you could sit there going bullshit, bollocks, 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 bullshit, bullshit, bullshit over everything I said. I can't force anybody to do anything. It's a consensual therapy is a consensual process. And I think some people miss that. They miss it or maybe it's missold to them. Maybe maybe therapists or therapy itself has, has oversold its power over the years to seem bigger, to seem more powerful. They come to therapy, we'll fix you. No, 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 like, no. I need my client to go with me. I've got homework for them to do. I've got stuff that I need them to do in their lives. I need them to tell me the truth. Like step one, I need the client to tell me what's really wrong. I need them to be somewhat vulnerable with me. Well, why would NPD ever do that? It wouldn't. So don't take this the wrong way. But what I am saying is, I guess 2018 should be a year where I start saying, all right, it's not. It's never going to be my main priority to help people who are on the spectrum of narcissism. But, you know, it. it's mental health at the end of the day. There's still, do not, do not, do not, take this as permission, as a permission slip from me to dive back into a relationship with a narcissist. You can't fix them, ever. A clinician may be able to at some point if we develop the right kind of technology and if you can convince the person with NPD that they need to be doing this, otherwise they're gonna have nothing left in their lives. This is discussed elsewhere by other people, that's not new. Um, the, uh, the first time I heard it was through Sam Backman, where he said that the narcissist will go to therapy with a degree of sincerity if they are in absolute crisis and they're in total depletion. At that point, if, we, if they were looking at diminishing the emotional flashbacks, healing the inner critic, that is going to be the thing. And you'd say, well, why not deal with healing the outer critic? On that course of healing the inner critic, I explain what this inner critic does. And I start I, and within the course, I probably more, I probably say more frequently the inflamed superego. The inflamed superego is a very powerful part of our personalities and it has a lot of different jobs. I th theorize that many times it is the superego that is triggering us into emotional flashbacks, not external events, not really. Um, and sometimes the inner critic is not just sending out words. You're a piece of shit. You're no good. You're useless or, or you're wonderful. You're the best. You're the most godlike, the most goddess-like thing ever. It might be sending out messages just through emotional flashbacks, intense feelings of worthlessness. So this is, I, I better wrap up here because I babbled on a little bit. I had, a few, I had a couple of coffees before and I think they hit me harder than I thought they did. Went to the gym, was tired. I was like, I want to do this video. I'll neck a coffee. Oh, that didn't really do anything. Started talking, realized it might have done. So when you're interacting with somebody who's maybe a bit BPD or what you would recognize as a vulnerable narcissist and they start punishing you and you don't know why, you're like, why are you attacking me like this with this level of hostility, with this level of vitriol? Often that is their superego is sending a feeling of worthlessness to them and their brain, their ego is sorting that as you made me feel this way. They're not aware there's a demon on the shoulder. They don't know there's a thing called an inflamed superego. They're not going, oh, my superego's bloody acting up again. They're just going, fuck, I feel like you, you, you made me feel shame. You made me feel worthless. You made, and this is uh, maybe not with overt narcissists, but those of you who've dealt with BPDs and, and vulnerable narcissists, this is, this is what they say, right? You shamed me. You made, no, 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 I didn't. But something inside of you clearly is making you feel this way. Maybe that's the inner critic. I just wanted to get that off my chest. It's just notes. These are just notes. Nothing I just said is backed by any clinical research that I'm aware of. And I'm not saying that you should go and get back into a relationship and let this feed your malignant optimism. Do not. And I'm not saying that this course would help somebody with MPD. It wouldn't. It's really designed for people with CBTSD who are sick of it, who just want to get better. What I am saying, and I wanted to spit it out, just get it off my chest, is just like, hey, if somebody was going to do it, if somebody was going to go out there and help people with MPD, maybe they could focus on healing the inner critic and healing the inflamed superego that's telling the narcissist, you need to, you need to step on people's faces right now 
or you're worthless. In order to feel baseline normal, in order to overcome this, these feelings of anxiety and rage and worthlessness, you, you better go out there and really hurt some people. Maybe that would be a good place to, to start. Thank you uh, for putting up with my what I realised towards the tail end is probably caffeine fueled <laughs> babble. Um, thanks so much for all the the, the for some really really sweet feedback, uh, really really kind comments uh, regarding the the course that was released yesterday, which is super cool. Ton of you jumped on it, which is great to see. Um, I'm looking forward to getting the feedback now. It'll probably be four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks where people are telling me what kind of results they've got from using the exercise in the course and what I'm hoping for, what I'm expecting um, based on the, tech, the, the work I've done with uh, clients. Um, is talking about a total cure or as damn near to a total cure for CPTSD as we can possibly get, which is really, really cool. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time and your attention. And um, I look forward to speaking to you all soon. Cheers.